Good evening, everyone. This is Pastor Smith of the Gospel Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. <clears throat> well, we had a beautiful day today. Uh, I believe the high was like 72 or 73 degrees. Sun was shining, and it was just beautiful outside. Clear blue skies, and uh, certainly a big difference from what we had a week or so ago with the snow and all the cold and so it made me uh, ready for spring to get here. I think tomorrow's high is supposed to be like 55 or something. So short-lived, but at least it was enjoyable for today. And it lets us know that, you know, spring is around the corner. Anyway, it's just, uh, it's good to be uh, back in service uh, online again this Thursday night. And uh, we certainly want to, Welcome everyone and and um, give it here just a few minutes for people to get logged in and um, I want to apologize for you know I have this time of year especially but I've had it for quite a while this just uh, you know sinus drainage I have allergies and so I, I apologize that um, that I have that problem and I can't seem to get through a whole broadcast without, you know, <clears throat> without that showing up on the broadcast. And I apologize for that. I'm trying my best not to, trying to do better on that. But anyway, um, I just want to, uh, want everyone to know how much I appreciate the opportunity to, um, you know, to expound a little bit on the Word of God with the the uh, what the Lord has allowed me to have an insight on in His precious Word and the blessings that it's been to uh, be a part of of God's great work in the earth. It's just I know that we are a highly blessed people, especially. Um, here in the United States, I'm, I want to say just a little bit maybe about the United States tonight. Um, you know, um, this country is such a blessed country. Um, and God has, has uh, imparted his gospel in this country uh, in such a dynamic way over many, many years. And uh, when you look at the history of our nation and then the fact that we've had uh, God's hand moving in our nation, where we have to, we have to uh, realize just how wonderful you know, God has been to the United States of America. Uh, I was just reading here recently to, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm re I've been reading uh, recently in the book of Deuteronomy. Of course, I'm reading, my wife and I are reading our Bibles through <clears throat> brother and sister Durham, Roy Durham and sister Laura, who have been with me now for, I don't know, let's see, since 1987, I believe. So that would be what, 90 That'd be 21, 31, 34 years. Does that sound pretty close to right? They're on here. Maybe they'll they'll uh, enter the amount right in here if I've got it wrong. Anyway, they uh, started testifying after the first year how they were reading their Bible together and, uh, and discussing it, you know, as they read it. And so I picked up on that and... and uh, so my wife and I started doing that, and then I started encouraging the church to husbands and wives to do that and read the Bible together. <clears throat> and I have said, you know, I've even said, um, uh, let me let me move my camera over just a little bit. Maybe it'll, it might look a little bit better. Let me see here. Put 
be a little bit more in the center maybe. We'll try that. Anyway, um, you know, I began to encourage husband and wives to do the same thing. I said, it'll help encourage you, you know, try to every day get your Bible reading in. And, and um, so, um, and then this past Sunday, I even encouraged those that, you know, maybe some of the sisters that are, I've got some widows, I've got some, you know, not unmarried people in the church. I encouraged them. I said, find somebody to read the Bible with. I said, today you can do it. You can FaceTime. You can, uh, you know, you can do it on Duo or WhatsApp, or you can get on, you can, you've all got a uh, Zoom now. Just two of you can get on a Zoom meeting and uh, read your Bible, read it together. If you have somebody to read it with, it just seems like it adds something to it. And then I've also been encouraging everyone to read the chronological Bible. Uh, I really prefer the King James. If you were going to not use the King James, I would never do away with the King James Version. But um, I, I, uh, if you're going to use a different version, I would recommend the English Standard Version in chronological order. I'd get the chronological Bible and... Uh, most of you probably know why, but I'll explain that, you know, when you're reading it in chronological order, um, it, um, it, it will help you because, um, like if you start off in Genesis, for an example, I think you'll read through the flood with Noah, which is around the 10th or 11th chapter there. And, and then it'll break off of Genesis and go straight to Job because Job is the oldest book in the Bible. So after the creation and after the flood, then Job was would have been after the flood. And, and so then we, you read the whole book of Job. And then it, when you finish the book of Job, it'll go back to the 11th chapter of, of Genesis. It's either 11th or 12th. I don't remember exact. And then Moses, he did write uh, just a few of the Psalms. And so when those Psalms fit into the timetable chronologically, that Psalm, like the first Psalms, the 90th Psalm that he wrote, that'll pop up and you'll read his Psalm. You'll read his Psalms, you know, through the five books of Moses. But then when you get to... Uh, for example, when you get to, um, uh, let's see, uh, the book of Samuel, for an example, um, when you get into da David's Psalms will start coming up in the book of Samuel. But then when you get into the prophets, um, it will also, and the kings, you know, the prophets will come in whenever they fit with the kings, whether they were a prophet of Israel or prophet of Judah, and you'll, you'll know more, you know, when that prophet prophesies at the time that he was under that particular king, some of them were under two or three kings, and they prophesied during that time, and you'll have a greater understanding of what that prophet's talking about. Uh, you know, sometimes the prophecy goes on uh, in the future, like Isaiah was uh, quite a prophet, his prophecy, you know, was uh, during the time of Hezekiah, but, and, and, uh, uh, but um, he, he, he prophesied a lot concerning Christ and his coming, but some of his prophecies had to do with the time that was at hand while he was living. And so when you read the chronological Bible, it helps you put it in perspective because I've, I've said this in our Bible studies that um, the Bible was put together even though uh, we pretty well like it, like for example in the prophets, it tells you what kings were reigning during the time of that prophet that spoke. Um, 
like Micah, for an example. Micah, his he prophesied before Isaiah, but it overlapped a little bit during that time. And he prophesied, uh, you know, uh, he, he prophesied mostly he was a prophet in Judah, but he did prophesy the fall of Israel to Assyria and, and uh, also the fall of, of Israel and, and Judah to uh, Babylon and even, even uh, the restoration. He prophesied of the coming of David and uh, as king. And so uh, it, it helps you to understand that as you get it in chronological order. Like I said, it, the Bible was put together uh, in categories, the five books of Moses, then the 12 historical books from uh, Joshua to uh, Esther, Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther, uh, you know, of course, uh, what was it, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, those, those 12 books uh, of history, but then your prophetical books, it's put together, you know, the prophet, the, the prophetical books, or the, po I'm sorry, the poetical books first, uh, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and uh, Songs of Solomon. Then your five major prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, then your minor prophets. So they were put together categorically, but when you read it chronologically, it puts each one of those books in its chronological order, how it actually took place historically. And uh, same way with the New Testament. So it will, it'll help you if you read it chronologically. And then of course, you know, keep your regular King James Bible uh, for your studying out of, but I recommend reading it in chronological order. It, it just will help you more in understanding the Bible. Anyway, let me get back. I'm just trying to recommend that to the people. Uh, we're just now in the very first part of March, so if you hadn't really started your Bible reading, you can, you can uh, easily catch up. You can read twice. You know, if you'll read two days at a time, uh, you can actually read the Bible through in six months. So if you're behind, if you'll read two days at a time, um, in one month, you'll catch up. Uh, you know, you might be a little bit over because you're going to be, well, you'll have to read a little more than that to catch through March, but it won't be long. And when you're reading with somebody, it's a lot more interesting. There's questions popped up. You'll mention uh, you may stop sometimes, like my Bible online. Um, I have an audio Bible by Alexander Scorby that my wife and I listen to, but she's following it in our Bible app. I really, really love the Olive Tree Bible app, and I recommend it above every app I've ever seen. Uh, it's just really a, an in-depth app, but very simple and very user-friendly. And I like getting it with the Strong's Concordance, getting the, uh, buy, you have to buy that, but it's, you know, everything else is free, but you can add as much research to it as you want to, but you can take notes, you can highlight scriptures, you can underline scriptures, you can make a note on any word, you can, you can click or touch any word if it's on your phone. Uh, if you got, if you have your phone, a, a computer, an iPad or a tablet of any kind, Samsung or Android tablet, um, it will automatically sync to every platform or every device that you have. So, you know, you can read it on your computer. If you make a change or add a note and then you go to your phone, it'll be on there. It, it'll put it on there every night but you can click the sync button and get it on there instantaneous uh, right away. But if you don't do anything, well, at least tonight, it'll sync it for you. And by tomorrow, everything will be on every device you've got that you, you know, that you look at. So I highly recommend the Olive Tree Bible app. And trust me, they don't give me a penny or even know that I'm recommending it, but I've just, you know, I really think it's, it's the best app I've been able to find. I've tried several over the years. 
You can make all your Bible notes in it. Uh, there's just very little you can't do with it. But anyway, what I was going to say was my wife follows, she's got that app on her phone, so she follows my the audible reading of Alexander Scorby reading the King James Version. And so sometimes I'll hit the pause button and I'll say, touch that word. I want to know what, uh, what the Greek or Hebrew uh, Strong's Dictionary says that word is. And uh, then we may discuss that a little bit. But then when we get through reading, we may discuss what we've read. But, uh, you know, some days we get real busy and we didn't get our reading done. But then maybe later in the day, we'll sit down and we'll say, hey, let's read our Bible. And let's get our Bible reading done. You know, and very seldom do we ever miss, but we always catch up. We're always ahead. I think we're ahead right now, like 10 days ahead of our regular Bible reading. Anyway, I want to go back. I want to, I said earlier, I wanted to say something about the United States. I wanted, to, if you would turn with me to Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter. I was, I was just listening to this reading. I don't remember if it was yesterday or when it was, but I was thinking about the United States while I was reading that. And I want to comment and I want to relate what we're going to read here in Deuteronomy 8. It's about the children of Israel. They're in the 40th year. They're, they've made their way across the wilderness. Uh, God, through Moses, is getting Aaron's already been, he's already died. Uh, and God's, God's going to be taking Moses here pretty soon. He's not going to let him go uh, into the promised land because of smiting the rock uh, and his anger towards Israel. Uh, but, um, but he is, you know, God's getting them ready to move into the promised land, and he's also getting them ready to come under Joshua's um, uh, headship of him being over Israel. So, but I just want to read this eighth chapter to you because I'd like to relate it a little bit. While I was listening to this, I was thinking about our nation, the United States of America. So I'm going to read the 8th chapter to you. I want you to follow with me, if you would. 8th chapter of Deuteronomy, chapter, verse 1. I'll give you just a minute to, if you'll let me take a sip of coffee, I'll give you a minute to get it, to find that in your Bible. I'll tell you something, something I'm working on. Um, right now, you're seeing me through, my video is by a, camera. It's called a Mevo camera that is operated right now on my computer as a webcam. Uh, I'm getting another one and it will sit on a tripod somewhere behind me or next to me and it will be pointing towards my computer. Right now on my computer I have half, half of my screen. I've got a 28 inch display and half of my screen is um, my camera on Facebook on this live broadcast, I can see myself. Right now, I'm looking straight into the camera, so I don't know what that looks like to you. But right now, I'm looking at me talking on the camera. So it's, I'm sure it looks better with me looking into the camera, but I can't, I can't seem to make myself do that. The other half of my screen is my Olive Tree Bible app with all my scriptures up there. And... Uh, uh, I will have a tripod sitting over here somewhere that will have a camera that will that will be fixed on my Bible. So when I read my Bible or show you a scripture, I can I I can I can control what you're looking at at looking at me on my iPad by touching this iPad. See, I I can touch it and move me around all over like that. Well, I want another camera that will point at my scriptures where I can switch from camera to camera and you'll be able to see the, just the half part of my screen that is fixed on my scriptures where I can say, look at the scripture and we can read it and then I can switch back to me talking. I think it'll be more effective for you to see the scriptures also at the time. Anyway, if you haven't found Deuteronomy 8, verse 1, you're probably not going to find it, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. It says, All the commandments which I command thee this day 
shall you observe to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee, to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Uh, when I was reading this, my mind just went back to the United States and I began to think about how virgin of a land this was when God sent our forefathers to the United States of America for freedom of religion. And there's no question in my mind, the reason I want to talk on this a little bit is because someone recently said, I can't see the United States in, in, in the Bible anywhere, in prophecy or anywhere. I want to talk about that a little bit tonight, but uh, I want to show you why I certainly believe that the United States is in the Bible. I think it's referred to, and I'll say more about that a little later, but I, I just want you to, I'm relating what I'm reading here to how God started this, con, this nation out and how God sent us here and humbled us, this people, proved us uh, to know what was in our heart just like he did Israel, whether or not we were going to be a godly nation or not. Verse three said, and he humbled thee, suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doeth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord, uh, of the Lord doth man live. Remember, that was one of the things that Jesus thought about turning bread to stone, but he remembered this scripture, that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And God built this nation, one nation under God. He built it with God-fearing forefathers and a God-fearing people and a people that had to go through rough times and and uh, they had to, they needed God and God blessed this nation because of their serving God and being obedient to God and letting his word work in our nation. Verse four says, thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. Thou shalt also consider in thy heart that as a man ch chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God. Uh, uh, to walk in his ways, to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water and fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees, pomegranates, land of olive oil and honey a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. When I read that, I thought about what a great nation America is the the uh, the minerals that's in it, the oil that's in it, the the beauty that's in this nation, the uh, a land that brings forth uh, abundantly in in agriculture. Uh, verse twelve said, At "Least when thou hast eaten and are full, and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein." And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, <clears throat> who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents, scorpions, and draught, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint. Remember, he, he, he give them water out of the rock. 
who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy later end, latter end. See, God took them through a lot of difficult times, but he said, I'm going to take you where <clears throat> you didn't plant the fields, you didn't dig the wells, you, you know, the beauty of the land. Uh, you didn't do none of the work. It was done by all of them before you. And he told me, he said, I'm going to run those people out of here because of their wickedness. I'm not doing it because of your righteousness. Let me say something to you right here about the United States of America. The United States of America hasn't been the greatest nation on earth for these many years now because it's because the people are greater people. Not because we're such a great people. It has to do with the fact that God chose this land and he did choose people, our forefathers, to bring over to this land. He, he no doubt put it in Columbus's mind to come across the waters of Spain and find uh, first the little island of Hispaniola, where is uh, the Dominican Republic and later Haiti uh, got the third western portion of that land uh, through slave trade. But then Columbus came on and found America. And uh, this nation was a preserved land. And God brought uh, our forefathers here who were fleeing to find a place that they could have freedom of religion and not be dictated to by a dragon power uh, dictating religion. Even though it was Christianity, it was not God's order. And it wasn't, it didn't have God's truth. Uh, in fact, the Bible said that, you know, that was the pale horse that the rider was death and hell followed with it. And that hell is talking about a religious hell. It's Tataru. It's talking about a, a terrible condition among men that were in prison, uh, even in religion. Uh, and this is not a, God's house is not a, a religious uh, uh, prison. This is a house where you voluntarily humble yourself before God, but not because he hadn't dealt with us to, to humble us. Like it says uh, in verse 16, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee and do thee good in the latter end. Now let's read a little further here. It says, but thou shalt, verse 18 says, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day, that you shall surely perish. That grieved me when, you know, when I think about this nation. I think about the great things that God's done in this nation. The word of God that he's poured out and imparted to this nation. The great moves of, uh, of evangelism. The great revivals this nation's had. And then when you think about the fact that God chose this nation to restore his church, to bring the revelation and understanding of the body of Jesus Christ to be restored. And in this nation is where that message was planted. God chose this nation for that. This is a highly chosen nation of God for God's purpose, for his plan. Not because we're so great, but he chose men to come here to do his will because it's his purpose. That's why we're here, not because we're a greater people. Uh, he even told Israel that. If you go on and read the ninth and 10th chapters, you'll see God tells them you're a stiff-necked people. Actually, I believe that the United States of America has actually, to a great extent, done a better job with what God's gave them to work with than Israel did back in those days coming across the wilderness. I mean, these people, they were stiff-necked. I mean, uh, if you remember 
you know, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Korah uh, rose up. They were priests. They were of the priesthood. And he said, and, and Korah charged Moses. And he said, Moses, you take too much upon yourself. Basically what he was saying, we're as good as you are. We know, you know, we're, we're of the priesthood. He forgot God used Moses to bring him out of Egypt. God used him uh, to lead that whole group of people that was more than 3 million people that came out of, or more than that possibly, but at least a minimum of 3 million people. They went into that country 430 years prior as 70 people and came out. I gave the figures last week that the first year at the end of the first year, God had Moses number, number Israel from of just the men that were capable of going to war from 20 years old upward of every tribe of 12 tribes, excluding the Levitical tribe. That was the priesthood, and they were not to be included in that. Uh, and the way they got 12 tribes, instead of Joseph, being a tribe, it included both his sons, um, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so one of those sons added the 12 tribe. Altogether, there were 603,550 men, the age 20 and upward, by the second year that they left Egypt. How many, how many boys was under 20? How many girls was in the family? How many wives or concubines did those men have? If you just said, well, I mean, there were fathers, there were brothers, so they were included 20 years old and upward, but how many little boys under 20 did each family have? It, I said, if they're just five, count the girls and the little boys and the wives and concubines, there would be 3 million. I estimate there was well over 3 million people. If there was 3 million, their encampment around the tabernacle, 12 tribes, their first, the encampment of the Levitical priesthood, then the encampment of um, the 12 tribes, three tribes to the east, three to the south, three to the west, and three to the north, 12 tribes. They said if, if there was 3 million, they estimated that they were 12 miles in circumference anywhere you wanted to look across that group of people. A lot of people don't realize how big a group of people was journeying through the wilderness and, you know, how many animals they had. <laughs> how, you know, what all it took to, for a priesthood to operate every day. I said Sunday, I said, how much wood, the, the wood could never go out in the tabernacle. How much wood did that take? for wood to burn day and night on the burnt offering. And then in offering up all those offerings, they had to offer up burnt sacrifice every morning and every evening, plus all of the sin offerings. You know, the burnt offering, the meat offering, the drink offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. Every time someone wanted, needed to offer up offerings, a, a sacrifice, how much wood did that take? Where did they get all that wood? How many animals did they have to kill to offer, offer all that? Of course, I, I realize a big part of it would, turned into food for them, except for the burnt offering. Everything in the burnt offering had to be burnt completely up. A picture of totally submitting your life to God. You got to offer, you got to put it on the altar. You got to put your life on the altar if you're going to serve God. Did you know how many Christian preachers, evangelists, teachers are teaching that message today? This became a watered down message. People have forgot that God brought us into a land of milk and honey in the United States of America and that our forefathers served God out of fear and awe and respect and honor of the word of God and they understood that they had to do righteousness to serve him. But today, you can live any way you want to and call yourself a Christian. I'm sorry, but that's not Christianity, not biblical Christianity. 
Let me, let me read a little further here. Verse 19 said, And it shall be if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day you shall surely perish. I wanted to read that again. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall you perish, because you would not be obedient under the voice of our Lord your God. When I read this, you know, and of course you you can read on, and it'll even give you greater uh, thoughts about our nation in America. And I realize God's talking to Israel in its um, early stages, but. I just want to, I wanted to remind you of the nation, this nation, and what God has done, what God has brought us to such a rich nation. I mean, here we are, we've got a pandemic, and our na our governors are spending billions of dollars. They're even giving free vaccines to get rid of this pandemic. Billions. I mean, they even... Already at one point, I don't know, what was it? Give us, give us like $1,200 a piece. Now they're wanting to give out $2,000 to anybody that makes under $80,000 a year. <laughs> There's a lot of people that's got money that didn't, you know, they're, you know, I sell standard poodles. My wife and I started doing that to help support the missionary work in the Dominican Republic. And God has blessed that immensely. And uh, I've got people buying dogs, I know, with a pandemic money that the nation has given them because there's no way they can know who needs it and who don't. So they just figure we're going to give it to everybody that's under a certain salary, certain finances. And talking about $80,000 a year, you know, I'm, I'm still, I'm, so my wife and I are, we'll be 72 this year. And so we're, you know, we still think in terms of houses that cost fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars being the really nice middle-class homes. I know it's not possible anymore, but that's my mind. I still think in terms of, you know, three to five hundred dollar a month house payments. I know that don't work anymore, but that's where my mind is. It's still I have a hard time. I remember it's been twenty-five years ago when the first man in my church bought a house that cost $100,000, and I, I told him, I said, you're crazy. You've, you, have you lost your mind? You'll never pay for it. But it's just, you know, I, I had to catch up. I was just at that old mindset of thinking like that, you know, and uh, so I know that, you know, I know finances has went up. I know that, you know, now what we used to pay for a house payment can cost you that could be your utility bill. <laughs> I understand those things, but I still have a hard time grasping it all. And uh, But I still know you can live on a lot less than $80,000 a year, a good life in the United States of America if you know how to ma manage it properly. Anyway, um, so uh, to say something now here about the United States, number one, I just want to mention uh, if if you don't think United States is an important nation to God, and I'm not saying that you don't, but you would have to, maybe I'd be better if I said that, you would have to believe this is an important nation to God, that he chose this nation to bring the revelation. And, you know, God started the Reformation with the Protestant movement way back in the 1500s. And then by 1901, he advanced it into the Pentecostal movement, but not until he got it to the United States of America. And there's where he poured out the Pentecostal experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues and a new group of people were born and God moved it a little bit further. We've always taught, if you take the type of the tabernacle, you know, the tabernacle, you went in the gate, in the eastern gate, you offered your sacrifice on the burnt offering, the high priest took the blood of the sacrifice, 
and sprinkled it around the altar. And then he went and anointed the, the horns of the altar in the holy place. He took that blood into there. But first he had to go to the, to the laver and wash himself. And then he had to change garments. He had a woolen garment in the outer court to do all that work of killing animals, skinning them, dividing them into pieces, burning them on the, on the brazen altar, spreading their blood around, uh, around the altar. And, and then he had to go wash himself in the laver. In fact, the priest had to wash himself in the laver every morning before he ever even started the priest office. Um, and, and then he had to change into a linen, a white linen garment to go into the holy place. And so all of that is a picture of, of the plan of salvation. The going in the gate, that was the gate of faith. That was Martin Luther's beginning message that the just shall live by faith that established Eventually, the, the Protestant movement was established. Martin Luther was the man that opened the gate and, and restored the gate of getting back in the kingdom of God through faith. And then John and Charles Wesley's message was sanctification. That you can't just you can't just have faith, but you've got to you've got to sacrifice, you've got to offer yourself a sacrifice to God. You've got to submit to God's will. You started off by humbling yourself to be baptized in water. Repent of your sins. That's a picture of the brazen altar taking place where it your sacrifice is burned up. God begins to humble the flesh and get you in a position that you're willing to sacrifice or submit yourself fully to God. That's why the burnt offering had to be completely burned up. There was nothing that was to be left of it. It was to be burnt. The whole offering was to be burned up. And then the priest, after he sprinkled the blood, by the way, it had to be your little animal. You had to put your hand on its head. You had to take a knife and slit its throat and kill it and realize that this little animal's blood and its life is being sucked substituted for me. I'm the one that should be standing there. Death. I'm worthy of death because of the sins and the corruption of mankind, the fall of Adam. I'm not worthy. I'm worthy of death because of sin. But God made it a way that this little animal, finally Jesus replaced that animal and he was your substitute and my substitute. And he died for you and for I. And uh, so that God would impute or count us righteous because of the work of Christ until God could work in our life, truly work righteousness in our life. So when the priest went to the altar, remember, if you're an overcomer and make the bride of Christ, you're going to become a priest, uh, a kingdom of priests. Uh, so we, we've got to do what Jesus did. We got to do what our high priest did. We got to do what the pictures of those priests did. They went to the altar. They washed themselves. That's a picture of us washing ourselves in the, in the, um, uh, water of the word of God. And that's the spirit of God's word, the spirit of God's word, revealing and imparting to us, uh, God's will. Uh, and God's word and his truths. There's where I've always took first, uh, second Peter one and said, you know, God added to our faith virtue. That was the brazen altar. That strength. Virtue is it's moral, it's moral strength. It's strength. Jesus, when the little woman touched him that had an issue of blood, crawled through the crowd and touched him, Jesus turned around and he said, I felt Virtue go out of me, power, strength, the strength of God. And uh, so God will have to help you, but that adds virtue to your, to your faith when you do the will of God in obedience. 
And then he said, add to your virtue, knowledge, temperance, and patience. And I say those three things is what, what's got in the labor, which is a picture of the Pentecostal movement. The gate and the, the brazen altar is a picture of the, of the Protestant movement of Reformation. Then when God added the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the Topeka, Kansas is where it started. It went from there to Houston, Texas. Uh, Brother Seymour took it from Houston, Texas to last Los Angeles, California. Finally settled in a little mission called at, on, a, on a Zoo, Azusa Street. Azusa Street Mission. Hundreds, if not thousands of people went in that little mission and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues and brought that all through America. By I say by 1903, America was so down and the Pentecostal movement was on its, uh, it was established. And so, uh, that was a that was a great happening, and the Pentecostal movement took place. Now, for over a hundred years, God showed a man by the name of William Souders, gave him a revelation of a restored church, and the body of Christ. That term, body of Christ, I don't believe was ever used anywhere emphatically or in a in a way to understand that is what the early church was called, the body of Christ. I think Brother William, William Souders was the first man that got another understanding of that. And I came out of Babylon. I came through Pentecostal movement. I was raised in the Assemblies of God. I came through the full gospel churches of fellowship uh, international. I came through basically most all of the charismatic uh, movement back in the uh, 70s before I came to this body in the later 70s. And so uh, uh, God used, he began to establish the body of Christ through Brother Souders here in the, in the United States. And, and he said that the Pentecostal movement was in the labor which I believe that we got knowledge. We got far more knowledge than Protestantism had uh, of truths. Uh, God used the threshing floor to establish that through Brother Souders' ministry. And then uh, there was uh, uh, that knowledge temperance. We had, this body had to go through many things to be tempered in the knowledge that God gave us and, and the understanding that was given. Patience. We had to learn patience, learn how to wait on God, learn how to let God show us how, you know, how to wait on him to lead us and guide us in all that he's brought us through these well over now a hundred years. And now I think we're moving out and have moved out of the Pentecostal era into the garment change. Add to your uh, patience, godliness. See, God likeness. We're having to learn how to be like God, not just obey the scriptures, but actually become a part of our character to a point that we're starting to think like him. We're starting to act like him. Our spirit is like Christ. God's trying to help us develop into the, being God-like in our behavior, in our character. Then add to godliness, brotherly kindness. I've said we don't really have charity. We're practicing charity, but we got to have brotherly kindness before you can add to brotherly kindness charity. And I, I'm not sure we've yet learned how to treat our brothers right. See, the altar you got faith to start off with, but then the altar's humility. It works humility in your life, the brazen altar. Then the fear of God is in the labor. That's where you learn enough about God and you learn enough about his knowledge, his being tempered, 
God will take you through enough things that should add to your humility. It should cause you to fear God and it should broaden your view, the breadth of God. But then uh, honor, for us to move into honor and how are you gonna love God who you've not seen if you don't love your brother who you have seen? And therefore, we're going to have to learn how to love our brothers enough and love one another enough. You know, uh, a brother will seek you out. See, an enemy might use your downfalls against you. Your a brother, he'll 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 search you out. Uh, he'll find your spirit. And if he loves you, he'll correct you. See, if you if you correct a fool, you'll get a block. I corrected a man not too long ago, and he ain't spoke to me since. A brother. And I was gentle about what I said to him, but he couldn't take that. So, so he made me his enemy. He didn't want to have nothing to do. What he ought to do is love me because I loved him enough to try to give him some correction. He was a younger brother, so I'm an elder. I, I was gentle about it, but he, he wouldn't take it. He wanted to argue with me about it. You know, I hate that, but I'm hoping, I still love that brother, and I, I hope God will touch him and, and help him to know that Brother Smith loved him. That's why, you know, that's why I uh, talked to him a little bit and tried to help him a little bit. Uh, because if your brother loves you, he'll be honest with you. See, and we have to quit. The Bible says, quit yourself like men. You got to be a man to be in this. You got to be man enough to face your faults and be corrected, be chastised of God or corrected of the Lord. And that's done a lot of times through the ministry. Anyway, uh, so we're in a garment change. We're learning to be godlike, and we're, we're having to add brotherly kindness. Um, you know, I want to, I want to honor, I want to love my brother. I want my brother to love me because I want to treat them like God treats them. And I want God to treat me. I want him to keep treating me as his child. I want to be a part of this because I do want to go into the holy place. I want that sevenfold light. I want that table of showbread, the unleavened bread, the 12 apostles doctrine the truth of God's word without any guile, without any uh, corruption, without any falsehood in it. I want that. I want the sevenfold light. I want the wisdom of God. I want the knowledge. I want the understanding. I want the knowledge. I want the fear of God. I want the counsel of God. I want uh, the, I mentioned knowledge, knowledge, counsel, fear, uh, the might the might of God. I want those things. And so um, then uh, uh, because I want to go, I want to see the holy place. I want, I want, that's a restored church. To me, that's, we've got to have a sevenfold light. We've got to have the apostles doctrine. I'm not just talking about the, the 12 apostles back there. I'm talking about what God's going to reveal down here. Now, go, go with me to the book of Revelations in the 13th chapter. I want to say something about um, the United States there. I want to start out in the 11th verse of the book of Revelation because I believe this is talking about the United States of America. And I know several men will not acknowledge that, but I think they should consider what I'm saying. John said here, I have beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. I want you to realize that in the first chapter, or second chapter, a verse, I mean of this same chapter, John saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having said it had seven heads and ten horns. This beast that came up out of the sea was Rome, and it had seven heads and ten horns. But all of those horns uh, came out of the sea. You know, Egypt 
came out of the world. Assyria developed out of the world. It didn't develop out of God's people. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon came up out of the world. It wasn't a godly nation under our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Medo-Persia came up out of the world. Greece came up out of the world. These are those seven heads. Rome came up out of the world. And now I want you to look at this two-horned beast came up out of the earth. And I want you just to consider that the earth here would have to mean something different than the world. I say it's religion. See, the sea, the sea, I'm a pilot, so I understand that the, that the sea level, sea level is zero. But the earth rises up out of the sea. It's a little higher than the sea. You know, the Bible shows that hills, mountains are religion. Prophetically, in prophecy, that's religion. And so anything that's a, that rises up above the sea is higher than the sea as far as influence is concerned. And, it, and it's always religious influence. And then it, look what it says. This beast came up out of the earth and it had two horns like a lamb. What nation? This nation is going to speak as, this beast is going to speak as a dragon a little while, so it has to be a nation. So what nation had two horns like a lamb? Where can you find the history of a nation that had horns or powers? And I, the United States started out with a civil and a religious power, lamb-like was built after the Bible. God-fearing men that built our Constitution after the Bible. Righteousness of the Holy Bible after the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what they came here with. They wrote our Constitution and made sure that they separated church and state. We'll maintain a government in the church We'll build it as much as we can on righteous morals to hold down corruption and evil and breaking of law, good righteous laws, but we will not control the church. We want to separate that. They saw what happened with Catholicism and how it ruled the world, dictated and murdered, martyred people. The Fox's Book of Martyrs martyred thousands, millions of people. So they made a separation, lamb-like. Separation of church. Let's let God run his church. Let's let God build the church. Let's don't let the government rule the church. And then it said, and he spake as a dragon, and verse 12 says, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. The beast before any dragon power, the last dragon power we had was Rome, the papacy, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast. See, I don't think that's just talking about the world. The earth is the religious people and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So there's going to be an image to the beast made, and I think the United States will do that, but they'll have to have, they will have to make an image to the beast before them, which is, which is Catholicism. And I can see that forming you might say, someone said recently, I don't see the United States in the Bible. Well, you don't see the 10 kings. You don't know who they are either, but they're in the Bible. This beast is in the Bible, but it doesn't tell us who it is. But if you just look, like I compared Israel coming through the wilderness and God dealing with them. 
That was the Jewish people. Then God had to come through the wilderness of the Gentile world and develop a nation and a people that could fulfill his will like Israel fulfilled in the end of the Jewish world through Jesus Christ and his ministry the body in the body of Christ. And God's restoring the church. is going to have a body down here. And there is a nation that he's doing that in. And all of us in the body of Christ recognize what nation he's using to do it. But now, just like Israel turned their backs on God and left God, I want you to look at this nation. They just, you know, they just voted in what, I don't even remember what it was altogether. The Senate just voted in, you know, that they're doing away with, with gender. You can't say anything about something being a male or a female. It's an it. God help this nation and our foolish bunch of leaders that think that they can turn their back on the God of heaven that established this nation. They think they did it because of their greatness, that they made this nation great. I'm here to tell you this nation is nothing without God. Without God and his help, this nation is worthless. But God made this nation great, and the reason he did it was to fulfill his plan and restore his church. But just as Israel turned away from God and rejected Christ, this nation, you mark my word, will turn against the church and turn it, they've already turned against God. Our, our governmental leaders could care less about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, the United Nations has passed a, na a law saying that Christianity is the most damnable Christian or the most damnable religion on the earth, and it must be stamped out. The UN has passed and voted against cre Christianity and says it needs to be done away with because it won't let people live how they want to live, however they want to live. God help this, this world. But this nation has forgot their God. And the Bible said that it, the nation that forgets God will be turned into hell. And that's a hellish condition. That's not just a, bur you know, a burning hell the religious world teaches, but that is a terrible hell when God begins to turn against a nation and judge a nation, which he will judge this nation for, for turning away from his righteousness. So they're, you know, just like in Israel, Israel turned against God at the same time that Israel rose up. Who rose up against God? Who rose up against the body of Christ if it wasn't Israel? Who slew Jesus on a cross? Pilate didn't want to do it. The leaders of Israel, the priesthood is the one that beckoned him to do it. He finally washed his hands, said, do what you want to do with him. I wash my hands of the matter. I don't find nothing wrong with the man. This nation will turn against the body of Christ and great persecution will come, but not until the church is restored first. He's going to hold back the four winds until he seals his servants in their foreheads. God is getting this ready, this nation ready for judgment. It's already entered into it. And you will see just one thing right after the other will happen to this nation. God will preserve his people, but God's letting us get a taste of some of the judgment with it because God wants us to get serious about what he's called us to do and what his purpose is. I don't mean to be a prophet of doom saints, but I've got to be true. I've got to be a true prophet if I'm going to prophesy. And what I'm prophesying to you is the truth. You cannot serve God and mammon. And God has, we are down in the end of this world and God is bringing this world to judgment and he will restore his church. He'll bring his church to judge. Judgment first must begin at the house of God, Peter said. It's time to grow up. It's time to, to get dedicated. It's time to get serious and be what God's called us to be. I was reading in James the other night with a question that was asked me 
uh, of the in well the in the missionary Zoom meeting that we had. What does it mean where it says that pure un, pure religion and undefiled is to visit the fatherless and the widows? Well, James was talking to the twelve tribes of Israel and and of the Christ, those in the body of Christ. And they understood the terminology. They understood widows were churches without without a husband. Fatherless were, were children of God without a proper ministry, without a father in the Lord to, to lead them. That was their, how did it say it? In their affliction. Their affliction was they didn't have a headship over them. They didn't have anyone to help them. He said, that's pure religion and undefiled is to visit those people. That's our job in the body of Christ is to help the people of God in Christianity that have a their their husbands are dead, their message is dead. Their children don't have a father to lead them right in the truths of the word of God. That's our job is to visit the fatherless and the widows and to keep yourself unspotted from this world. Keep yourself righteous. You have to do that to be able to help anybody. Anyway, God bless your hearts. I went a little bit over time, maybe tonight, but but uh, I won't charge you any extra for it, okay? <laughs> God bless your heart. Listen, we've lived in a great land and we're still in the land that flows with milk and honey. This is a rich nation compared to other nations. You don't believe it, just go to third world countries and I'll promise you, you spend very much time over there like I have in the missionary field you'll come home and want to kiss the earth when you get back to America. Even though it is sad, the condition and what's going on in this nation, but it's what the reason we're doing as well as we are is because God's judgment hasn't failed yet, but it will. In fact, I'm going to give you a couple more scriptures right quick. Go with me to the sixth chapter of the book of Revelations. This is, this is talk, these are the seals. And this is the six seals. Okay. And first, the, the four horses, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. That was the falling away of the church. Then it showed the, those souls under the altar, white robes were given unto them. They were counted worthy. And God gave them righteousness for a just resurrection, in my opinion. Uh, verse 12 said, And I beheld when he, op- I, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. I'm going to say unto you that great earthquake is a shaking in this world. We're in the sixth seal right now when America is judged by God and falls. It's going to shake this whole world and every nation in it. That's not going to happen until it it speaks first as a dragon and it builds an image to the beast. Somebody's going to do that. Why can't you see that it's America that's more than likely? I know it don't say the USA is going to do this, but I am a prophet and I'm telling you that this is talking about the United States of America. And the sun became black, black as sackcloth of air. See, the Old Testament was that this was this shaking was World War I or World War II. No, this is a far bigger shaking than that. We overcame that. We won't overcome this because the sun is going to become black and the moon is going to become a blood and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. When God judged Pharaoh, when he judged Babylon, every other dragon he judged, he put the lights out. They were the light of the world because they was the dragon power that ruled the world. And the United States is becoming that kind of power, but it's not as great as it will be before it's over with. But I'm sorry if you think that a conservative Christian government is going to get that job done. No, they're going to turn against Christ, and it's probably going to be a democratic uh, liberal power that has no conservatism nor no feeling concerning the God of Israel. 
and his son, Jesus Christ. And heaven departed as a scroll that rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and great men and rich men and chief captains and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man hid themselves in dens and in rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For that, for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? God help us to be able to stand when the wrath of God gets poured out in the end of this Gentile world. And then he saw in chapter seven that there's four winds gonna hold back. Look what it says. Verse two said, I saw another angel sending out of the east having sealed the living God and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And he said, say, hurt not the earth. See, I told you that's, that's religion. That's God's people. There's a lot of God's people that's in the world, backslid, there's some of them are victims, some of them starved to death, but God will, in his judgment, in his dealing harshly with this world, he'll shake this world, many of them will come back to God. They'll realize their need for God. Neither the sea, that's them, that's those that's in the world that have backslid, starved to death, they're victims because they were hurt with an unjust, you know, or unwise ministry nor the trees, that's God's people. Don't you hurt any of these until we seal the servants of our God in their foreheads. So God's gonna hold back. He's holding back these four winds, civil power, military power, agriculture or financial powers, social powers, and religious powers. God's those powers, those winds are blowing. This world is getting unstable. It's shaky, but God's not gonna let that happen and destroy this earth until he seals his servants in their foreheads. Then I'll get in the finally will come. Now, quickly go with me to the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations. I wanna give you one more, one more picture here. Okay, this is where, you know, John looked and the tabernacle had to be measured because it was all of the whole holy place and the holy of holy was done away with. And there wasn't anything left but the outer court and the Gentiles trotted underfoot and the picture of Ezra and Nehemiah showed that even the furniture, even part of the foundation had to be rebuilt. That's been the work of this body of Christ, restoring the church. Restoring the tabernacle, the things I mentioned, the, the not only the gate and the, the brazen altar, but the laver, uh, the, the, the garment change period. Uh, finally, we've got to restore the holy place. Okay, so then he shows that these two prophets, the two witnesses, the Old and New Testament, he shows that they, they, they were in sackcloth and ashes and they laid dead in the streets for three and a half days. That's a picture of prophetical 1260 years that they laid dead in the streets. The, the word of God had no life. There wasn't a ministry during that period of time before, the, before Protestantism and the Re Reformation began. But then after that, when the Protestant, when the Reformation period began in verse 12, it said, and they heard these two witnesses, the Old New Testament, a voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. That's men of God that God was using in Reformation. And finally, the body of Christ and the ministry that God's developed said, come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. That's a restored church. That's not the bride being caught up. That's getting up in a heavenly place in a cloud of witnesses of those that were faithful and diligent to God and done his will in this work of reformation. 
and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and the tenth of the part of the city fell, and the earthquake was slain of men, 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. That, second, that earthquake right there is the same earthquake. When the church is going to be restored, you watch the United States will fall. It will be a shaking that will shake this entire world. And the 10 kings. For the 10 kings to come in power, can't you see the United States will have to be in a demise? The United, there's nothing going to rise up in this world as long as the United States holds the position it's in, it will have to fall and God will judge it and 10 kings will come into place. And the second woe is passed, which is the falling of America, in my opinion. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly and that's Armageddon. God help us. You know, we, we have to face it, saints of God. We have to face the reality that we're living in the end of a world and any nation that has turned as into corruption as this nation and our government leaders are turning away from the righteousness of God in heaven and his son, Jesus Christ, after him impar in imparting his word of God and his the labors he's put in America and this country turn against him and you don't think God's gonna judge it? Come on. God's judged every nation that he spent anything in building his truth and righteousness in that turned away from him. There'll be a remnant. There'll be a remnant in this body that will be saved. And out of that remnant will make up the remainder of the bride that will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And I recently posted 12 things that's got to happen before the end of this world and before Armageddon. And Armageddon's number 12. I could mention them again, but I won't mention them here tonight. But anyway, I hope you receive what I've said tonight. Consider, pray. Let's, let's try to get as close to him as we can, saints. We're in a wonderful place. I know it sounds like a bad place, but it's, we're living in a time of the greatest move of God that's been in the entire Gentile world since the falling way of the early church has ever took place. The greatest move of God is coming. We're going to send to God the two witnesses in his people. The Old and New Testament are going to send into a restored church and harvest this world, harvest this world for God and Savior shall rise up on thee, Mount Zion, and bring righteousness and, and bring God's people into the greatest glory that this world, this Gentile world, has ever seen. So it's a great time for God's people. But you better stay in the cave. <laughs> that I'm, I'm using uh, Elijah was in the cave while the rocks, the wind blew and and broke rocks against the mountain. There was an earthquake. That same earthquake's the fall of America. Then there was fire and brimstone that fell from heaven. That's judgment. But as long as Elijah was in the cave and God wasn't in, he, he's the one that brought the wind and the earthquake and the fire. But the Bible said God wasn't in those things. That meant he wasn't in it for, for Elijah. Elijah was in the top of the mountain in the cave. That's the body of Christ. Stay in the grave. Don't get shook out of this. Don't let your bad spirit, don't get a spirit. I was going to say earlier about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, how Korah told Moses, you take too much on yourself. We're just as great as you are. You know what God said? He said, everybody get away from these men because I'm going to show I'm going to show what spirit these men are of. And God opened the earth and swallowed them up. Swallowed up all those people and destroyed them. And the earth closed up on them. And you know what the people said to Moses that right after that? 
They said, you killed these men. They charged him for what God did. So you know what God said to do? He said, take every leader of every tribe, take all of their rods of all those leaders, get every one of their rods, take them in the tabernacle of testimony, write their name on every rod because I'm going to show them who I choose to lead this people. The next day, all those rods stayed the same except Aaron's rod budded and had a beautiful bud of flowers on it. And God said there, this I chose the priesthood and the high, and the high priest. Under Moses' rule, I chose this ministry to lead you through a high priest. So all of you, come everybody come get your naked rods that don't have your any buds on it that makes you think you're as good as anybody else. That ought to be a picture to men that rise up against their pastors. You know, I talked to a young lady recently that God had her, she's done a great, God's using this girl, 26 years old in Africa. And She was with this group of people, but all what God was leading her to do was a little bit outside of what their uh, norm was. You know, they're, you know, everybody's concerned about what the norm is today. Let me tell you something. You can't put God in a box. Everything can't be, your norm can't be everything God. God don't get in your norm. You got to get in his and his norm changes because he's moving. God's moving us through the wilderness. He's taking us into the land of Canaan. He's taking us into a restored church. And uh, anyway, this girl, she said, I knew that God was moving me outside of the people I was with. But she said, I kept praying and I did not want to be rebellious against the order that God put me in. I thought, child, why can't people see that? Why can't men with the wrong spirits that rise up and work in iniquity in the body of Christ against the ministry that God called them under? You say, well, I don't like the way they do things. You ain't never going to find a ministry you like the way they do everything because you ain't in charge. They are. And there ain't no ministry that's perfect in a perfect way is going to make everybody happy. Not everybody was happy with Jesus. You ain't going to be happy with everything because you ain't going to understand everything when it's done, but in a little while, God will help you. But when you rise up against the ministry that God chose and all you can say is, I don't like the way they do things. Are they immoral? Have they confiscated the money? What have they done that disqualifies them from ministry? And who are you to think you can disqualify? You don't trust God? You don't believe Jesus can? He, he, he sets up kings and he removes kings, but you don't think he can remove a pastor that don't do right? I'll guarantee you, you remember what David did? Saul was trying to kill him. And he, he would not lift his hand against the anointed of God. See, when a ministry sanctions a man, a, a man, a pastor, a minister in this body, that's the anointed of God. God stood with this ministry. And until this ministry judges, who is, who, who, what person underneath that ministry has the qualifications to judge that? What a spirit to get in. I would just run and say, forgive me. Help me to accept you as my leader because you're in the town I live in. And I'm going to have to learn how to work with you and, and, and live right and do right and build. I understand it because when I was young, I got in the wrong spirit and God had to correct me. You know what he told me? He said, you never lived in these men's shoes that are leaders Anybody can tear down. Anybody can be a demolitionist. But not very many people has the wisdom to build. 
So you know what God told me? He said, learn to shut your mouth and agree with the leadership that I've given in this body. Because what you're saying is you want to be the leader. You want me to put you in charge because you know more than everybody. But God told me, he said, hush your mouth and quit tearing down and now roll up your sleeves and learn to build. And what you don't agree with, shut your mouth. Keep your keep silent about that. Quit being a, a, a worker of iniquity and tearing down everything. And what you can agree with, build on that. You know what? I found out things I didn't agree with. I started agreeing with them. I started seeing the wisdom because I quit looking at everything through negative eyes. And God helped me. Oh, I'm so thankful today. <laughs> that I don't have a spirit to tear down the people, of the men of God. We got to learn to work together. We got to learn to have honor. We got to learn to have brotherly love, filial love, love your brother, especially those that, that are over us in the Lord. You know, fear and love them, work together with them, saints. Oh God. Anyway, God bless your hearts. I went overtime tonight, but I had the ball and I was running with it. I feel God in what I said tonight. I feel an anointing to talk to you about what I talked to you about. So God bless your hearts. Remember to pray for the baby Mallory, Brother Phil and Sister Chelsea Fisher's baby. She's still in the hospital, but she's making marked improvements almost on a daily basis now. And it looks like she's gonna be able to come home soon. Keep her in your prayers, please. Sister Cindy Smith, <clears throat> my daughter-in-law, she's got to go to Fort Worth this weekend and, and take care of her mama, help the family. Uh, they need her help this weekend, so pray for her on her trip. Pray for her mother. She's up in her 80s, and her health's not good, and, and uh, she needs her prayers. So pray for her. Pray for Brother... Uh, Ray Weaver and Susan Weaver, uh, their home recently caught on fire. Uh, he's had to have surgery. He had, uh, he had to have a kidney removed. He's in the rehab, but I think he's going to get out of it by tomorrow. So uh, uh, please pray for him. Pray for Brother Wallace. Brother Wallace hadn't been to church in a while now and uh, because of his sicknesses. Thank God. We, had, we had, don't have anybody's got COVID, but we've got other issues that we need God's prayer. Pray for Sister Melva Rodriguez's brother in Mexico that has uh, coronavirus. Brother uh, Fidel in um, Guatemala City, Guatemala. He, he was one of their brother days for many years. Uh, he, uh, he's probably on here tonight. Uh, yeah, let's see. Let me see if I see him. <laughs> um, anyway, pray for him. He's got a, a brother in, um, in um, Bowling Green, Kentucky that has COVID that needs our prayers. And he's also got a father-in-law in Florida that's got COVID. Pray for Sister Betty Layton. Brother Gerald and Sister Betty Layton in Winters, Texas. This is a precious sister that came in under my ministry, got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That was back in the early 80s in Winters, Texas when I was pastoring that little church there. And she's still there, but she listens to our services. She's probably on here tonight. Her and her daughter, Tansy. Keep her in your prayers. Uh, pray for the work in the Dominican Republic. Uh, the work in Mexico. Pray for Brother Bud's works. Brother, I miss Brother Johnny Bud. Y'all don't know. He was closer to me than a brother. Some, I'm gonna, sometimes I, I got a picture the other day. I thought, I'm going to tell Brother Bud about it. And then I caught myself and realized the greatest, you know, my best friend. And I'm sorry, but he was just closer to me than a brother. I, I wasn't, I've never been that close to any one man that I know of for that that long. I miss him dearly. My wife misses Sister Eudora. 
And so their works, uh, we pray for them. We care about them. Uh, so pray for also Brother McNabb's wife, Sister Pauline. We lost Brother McNabb recently, and she's going through that loss. And pray for her comfort, Brother Goss there in Keswick, Ontario, Canada. He's getting up in years, and, you know, he and his wife need our prayers. The work in Montreal uh, in Ottawa, that work in Canada. Pray for them, those brothers uh, up there, those pastors that are the main elders of that work. Brother Noel, Brother brother David Paul, Brother Anselo, uh, Brother Winslow, Winslow the, the, those brothers up there. Remember them in your prayers. Um, this work of God, let's just keep the brethren lifted up. Let's try to remember men of prayers. Uh, so Sister Abraham certainly needs our prayers here in our local church. She's, she's, uh, she really needs the Lord to touch her body. She has a real uh, serious condition. She's up in years. So remember them. I'm trying to remember everyone. Forgive me if I, I'm not trying to leave anyone out, but you know, I know that there's needs all over Brother Emilio Green. Pray for him. He needs the Lord uh, to touch him in many different ways. So do his brother Elias Ciprian and Brother Rudy and Brother Jackson, Brother Calderon, Brother Sarain, Brother, uh, brother Jacob, those brethren over there. Uh, so many of them need need a touch of God, need God's help right now, this, this uh, pandemic. Any of you that's under my voice that could afford to give a little offering to the missionary work, I'd appreciate it. I've got so many needs and I just cannot meet them all right now. I'm asking God to help us. Uh, I just have to wait on the Lord to try to put something in our hands to to try to help those people with. I've got needs over there right now that there's just no way. You know, I had, I've got, <laughs> I've got a brother building a church that's out of material that he's asking me for help. I don't have any money. I don't have the money to help him right now. He's going to, he needs about $5,000 worth of material. I don't have that. So pray, you know, that I know God. I just wait on the Lord. He knows what we need. And he knows how to meet our needs. I, I don't have any doubt that God's watching over us. And so we just wait and be patient for God to help us. But sometimes if we don't make our needs necessarily uh, people aware of it, then, then they don't know that we, you know, God may touch them. All right, God bless your hearts. I could talk a while tonight. I feel the spirit of a preacher on me. God forgive me uh, for taking too much of your time. Have a good evening. God bless your hearts. I'll see the local church Sunday, but we do have a uh, work day Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning. We've got several things to do at the church. All of you local brethren that can be at the church and help us out, please come lend a hand. There's plenty of work for everybody there to do. God bless your hearts. The rest of you, I'll see you Sunday morning. Uh, breakfast at 9.30 in the dining room, 10 o'clock Bible study, 11.30 service. God bless your hearts. Brother Michael Smith, even though Cindy's going to be out of town, he will be here with us. And so I'm thankful for that. Have a good night. Bless your hearts. I love you people of God. I sure do. Right. Good night. <laughs>